but we fully expect this next leg down. And that's because we think the economy is softening quite significantly. The data tells us Hello everyone, today our guest is Michael Howell. Michael J. Howell is a managing director at Cross Border Capital Lead. He founded Cross Border Capital in 1996. Michael developed the quantitative liquidity research methodology while he was research director at Salomon Bros. In this video, Michael Howell talks about the liquidity crunch the current market is facing and how the Fed's quantitative tightening affects liquidity. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you. According to CNBC's September Fed survey of economists, fund managers, and strategists, those surveyed said there's a 52% chance that U.S. could enter into recession over the next 12 months. The probability of recession, I think it's much higher than 50%. I think it's about 80% maybe even higher than 80%, Hank told CNBC's Street Signs Asia on Friday. If they continue the quantitative tightening and move that growth rate and M2, money supply, into negative territory, it'll be severe. Hank was critical, and has been in the past, of the Federal Reserve's failure to manage inflation through keeping an eye on the large supply of money sloshing around in the U.S. economy. In other words, that looks at uh, the ability to transact in security markets around current prices uh, in size, in the required size. So that's a very technical definition. What we're looking at is something very different. We're looking at what we call funding liquidity. In other words, it's the ability of somebody to actually uh, uh, enact the transaction, uh, have the credit backing or have the funds available to do that. So we're looking at funding liquidity, and generally, uh, we think of liquidity or global liquidity as a balance sheet concept. It really measures the capacity of capital in the system, but it really uh, is a measure of the flow of money. Think of it as the flow of money through all financial markets worldwide. Correct, and you would expect market liquidity to derive from funding liquidity. So if market liquidity starts to deteriorate, it's really a, a heads up to the fact that funding liquidity is, is already going down significantly. And that's very much the case at the moment. There's a lot of uh, you know, indicators that one can take uh, looking at deteriorating bid, bid ask threads, the fact that new issuance is actually very low right now, the ability to get deals away is limited. And if you look at the number of failed trades that are uh, passing through US primary dealers in the treasury market, that's starting to pick up quite significantly, worryingly so in fact. Uh, how we measure liquidity is, is uh, maybe more straightforward. What we're looking at is the amount of cash that different entities, for example, central banks, uh, for example, private sector banks, high street banks, shadow banks, cross-border investors uh, basically put into the system. It's their general credit creation within financial markets. Now, just to be absolutely clear, what we're not looking at here are the traditional monetary measures such as M1 or M2. Those are much more retail definitions of money. They don't really have a lot of bearing on financial markets. They're much more real economy concepts. Uh, in many ways, the liquidity measures that we look at uh, pretty much kick off from where traditional monetary aggregates like M2 end. Okay, I think the, the easiest way to see this is to basically start to question what the financial system really does. And if you pick up a textbook, uh, an economic textbook, what they're really saying is that the financial system is a new financing system. And that's how we understand it. So interest rates are important. In fact, that uh, is now completely wrong in many ways. The financing system is really a refinancing system. Uh, and it's a refinancing system because there's huge amounts of debt out there. If you think of the debt load that the world economy has got, it's now something like $350 trillion. That debt has an average life of about five years, which means you've got 70 trillion of debt to refinance every year. And that's where liquidity becomes very important. It's not interest rates that matter in that context. It's the ability to get the roll on the debt. In other words, to refinance your positions. If you don't refinance your positions, you either default or if you're a mortgagee, you're homeless. So it's, it's absolutely critical. And uh, traditional economic textbooks miss this refinancing element. Now, if you look at the uh, new financing uh, part of the economy, uh, with a world economy of about $100 trillion, let's say a fifth of that is CapEx, 
About half of that is externally financed through capital markets or about $10 trillion. So what we're really saying is the 70 of refinancing compares with the 10 of new financing. It's a seven to one ratio. So the system is really about refinancing. Interest rates are less important. The volume of liquidity is key. If you get uh, uh, slowdowns in liquidity, the ability to refinance is challenged and you get financial crises. Financial crises are not about failures to uh, finance new capital, it's to finance existing debts. And that's why if you look back over the last 20 or 30 years, all the major financial crises that we've seen have basically been problems about refinancing, whether in the repo markets or the mortgage-backed security markets or wherever it may be. But basically the uh, liquidity index that we calculate is now in free fall. So it's dropped from very high readings, the index uh, we, uh, we scale between 0 and 100, has dropped from levels of about 80, so very loose liquidity, to latest values as of uh, the end of July of barely 20. So there's been a dramatic falling off in liquidity. Now, why does that matter? It matters because if you look at the growth rate of global liquidity, it has had an unparalleled correlation between that and asset prices worldwide. And there's a subsequent slide which basically shows that correlation. Now, one of the things that we indicate on that slide is the projection of global liquidity growth into 2023 and beyond. And that expectation or uh, projection of growth is based on what central banks are telling us they are going to do with QT. Uh, this is gleaned from what the Federal Reserve has pronounced in terms of its runoff of uh, Treasury holdings. It's what the ECB implicitly have been saying about what their balance sheet will do uh, as the previous support uh, uh, unwinds following the COVID emergency. And also what other big central banks like the People's Bank of China is slated to do. And if you look at that, the picture for liquidity is ghastly. It looks really bad. If you follow the letter of that projection, there will be financial dislocations in markets over the next 12 months. I don't believe that central banks will be able to do that because I think they'll have to reverse out. And that's why I think there'll be a pivot coming at some stage in early 2023. That pivot may not involve um, a, a cut in interest rates, but it will probably mean that the Federal Reserve at least sits on its hands for some time and digests maybe some of the damage that's being done here. OK, I think the first thing is to look at some sort of template about how markets are moving. And one of the things that we show is a chart that looks, if you like, at the standard bear market behavior of the S&P. So what it looks at is a chart which shows uh, the average movement of the S&P uh, in a bear market. This is data which goes all the way back to 1970. We've indexed it so you get a sort of a standard run of what the market would look like. There's a sharp V uh, as the market collapses and then a rebound on the other side. On that same chart, we plot uh, liquidity, US liquidity in this case, uh, with the red line. And what that shows is how liquidity leads the market and the sort of things that one can expect coming out of that. Now, generally speaking, and this is the thing to think of, and bear in mind, of course, this is an average, an av you know, every cycle is different, but this is the average uh, look. What it shows is the market typically falls by about 25% in the first move down. That is when investors start to reassess growth in the economy, and it's because of central, largely because of central bank tightening. So in other words, it's when PE multiples start to collapse. And that's the phase that we've been in. Now, one of the things that you'll see from the chart is, interestingly enough, there's always an up leg, another up leg. In other words, that uh, the market goes down 25%, it rebounds. That rebound has tended to average about 10%. It's lasted about two to three months on average. And then you get another leg down, a second leg down, which is based much more on a traditional credit cycle or earnings cycle when the economy is weakening and earnings numbers are being slashed. And that fall is normally of the magnitude of about 15 and 20%. Now, that tends to mark the low in the market. Coincident with that, liquidity conditions tend to spike up significantly. And it's around that low point that the Federal Reserve is on maximum warp for ease. OK, uh, we haven't reached that stage yet. We're still in the, uh, the rebound phase. And that rebound phase may have gone a tad further than uh, the average. But you get the idea that this is the normal sort of sawtooth pattern on the market. OK, I think there's another leg down. 
Um, you know, we uh, maybe we expected a rebound, uh, you know, maybe after this sharp drop in the first half year. We've been surprised by the intensity of that. So we're, we're clearly, you know, rethinking to see whether or questioning our views to see whether they're correct. But we fully expect this neglect next leg down. And that's because we think the economy is softening quite significantly. The data tells us that Asia is already in recession, that Europe is pretty much getting there and the US may be a month or two behind. But we're certainly moving in that direction. Uh, the big debate, I think, at the moment is how deep that recession will be. Uh, we're pretty equivocal at the moment. We're not sure it's going to be a deep recession. We think it's going to be a recession nonetheless. But that is more likely to be a big earnings recession rather than an employment recession. And the reason we say that is that if you look at the, uh, you know, the, uh, the fact of the last two years, the COVID crisis, the skills shortage, the fact that this recession has been probably the most well flagged of any recession I can remember, I think a lot of corporations are going to hoard labor. They will not want to let labor go quickly. So I think in that context, the employment numbers may stay elevated. Uh, that will put pressure on unit labor costs. Uh, that will hit profitability and that will cause a big profit slump. Now, the irony in that is that that may be not be enough to move the dial for the Federal Reserve to start easing, okay? Because employment is their focal point. That's the lens they right. look through to gauge things. So you may get the worst of all worlds for equities, uh, a Federal mm. Reserve that is uh, stubborn, but earnings that start to fall away. Now, what we're seeing at the moment is a cyclical downturn, a very sharp cyclical downturn. In many ways, that cyclical downturn is uh, as big or bigger than we saw at the time of the 2008-9 global financial crisis, which is uh, clearly a reason to be worried. Uh, normally, yeah. in these periods of tight liquidity, you get some sort of financial disaster of some form, uh, whether it's a Lehman moment or whatever, it's very difficult to predict ahead of time. And that's why we're cautious about the credit cycle looking forward six months. And that's why we fully expect central banks to come back and pivot because liquidity is so important into the system. So that's that's the general picture. And in terms of the duration of that cycle, it tends on average, if averages ever work, to be about 65 months. So we're talking about, you know, around about five to six years in duration. The Fed flooded the U.S. economy with large amounts of stimulus and liquidity to keep it afloat during the pandemic but did not focus on carefully reducing that money supply over time, the professor said. The M2 supply of money, a broad measure of money supply, which includes cash and deposits, has been growing by double digits in the past three years. Now the growth of M2 money supply is slowing too quickly, and that could send the economy into a recession. They are not addressing it correctly. In the five months, we've seen broad money major in the United States flatline. It's not growing at all. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.